Good morning, good morning. Welcome back to our final uh, week in Malachi. We'll finish it off today. And let's start with a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this study in Malachi. And thank you, Lord, and help us to look at this last uh, chapter uh, to uh, get a good glimpse of the, the future and uh, what's in store. I'm particularly looking forward to the arrival of your uh, your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we're finishing off Malachi. And uh, this is the point where we actually see the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, prophecy of John the Baptist that we've been mentioning as the forerunner to uh, announce the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So we'll start off with that picture, I guess. Uh, and uh, we will get started on some verses. Not a lot of verses, to, not a lot of verses left in Malachi, but a lot of a lot of reference verses to the stuff we're talking about here. So still still probably will be about a half hour. <clears throat> so I call this the faithful few and the final judgment. There were definitely people that uh, understood uh, that the, uh, the the coming of the Messiah was uh, was foretold. And they were faithful to the Lord through through it all, and then get uh, discouraged uh, and then waiting for and waiting for the day that that happens. As we seem to be uh, seeing the same thing kind of happen in our own day and time, where people are getting a little, uh, you know, it's funny they even have a prophecy about it. Uh, that uh, uh, when is the Messiah coming? When is Jesus coming back? And that's the question that everyone is talking about these days, especially with the the things we see happening in uh, the Middle East, things that look like they're, they're starting to see the foreground of the uh, coming kingdom, the tribulation period, Ezekiel 38, a lot of those different things. Uh, could We all could be totally wrong, and it could be a long ways off. But it's exciting to think that uh, it's getting real, real close, and we're going to see and be in our Lord's presence uh, very soon. So let's get started here. Uh, verses. And we left off in verse 15 last week. So we're picking up at verse 16 of Malachi th chapter 3. And they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that threw upon his name. I read this, I, the first thing I could think of was the, uh, the, the Lamb's book of life, or the book of life that, uh, that God, God records all those who are faithful to him in. And the book of remembrance seems to be uh, fit that category too. For those that feared the Lord, uh, what a beautiful thought. They were even talking about it back then. Uh, a psalm actually uh, speaks to this. In Psalm 56. But I think what I'm going to do first, I'm going to read through uh, what's left. There's not a lot of passages, and then we'll dig into them. So let's continue reading and get a feel for this This final. It's actually not only about eight verses left, because chapter four is actually pretty short. <laughs> it's only six verses. So let's go. Verse 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them, as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Talking about those faithful few. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Sounds a little bit like the tribulation there. Jumping into chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. This kind of reminds me of the other picture that I have in my, uh, my, dis my opening slide there. This one here. So I'll switch to this one for a second. The day that Jesus Christ returns, and that's all, and that's us behind Him, all of us faithful the church, uh, the body of Christ. So continuing here, 
But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise from, with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of a stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, every time you see the day of the Lord, it's talking about the, the tribulation period. Uh, so don't get confused with that, with the com the first time of the coming of the Messiah. And it says, yeah, I'm going to sing Elijah. And it's interesting, uh, when you study the New Testament, uh, that uh, when they talk about John the Baptist, who is coming in the spirit of Elijah. Verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers. At least I come and smite the earth with a curse. So th this verse here kind of, I think, I, I picture it as, you know, if, G if, they, if, if, the, uh, if the Jewish nation had accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah when he came the first time, I think some of this may have played out differently. But he says here, yeah, or I'll come and smite the earth with a curse. The curse might have been the fact that he didn't accept his son as uh, corporate Israel. And so that uh, he left again. He went back to his place in heaven and it, uh, to wait for the coming judgment uh, day, uh, still future. Of course, God knew all this ahead of time. But at least here, he wanted to give the, give the impression that if people would have hearkened unto his voice and and uh, and understood who his son was, that uh, things would have been different. Okay, so picking up with verse 16, we'll dig into these verses. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Go on to Psalm 56, 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? There's a, there's a, there's a uh, couple of verses, and this is one of them, that talk about the fact that God uh, even knows our tears and collects them all for us. And that uh, if we truly love the Lord and we're one of his, that he knows everything about us, including how many tears we've shed. God will remember those who remain faithful to him and who love, fear, honor, and respect him. Okay, so verse 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Some other verses on this in Nehemiah 13, 22. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, and they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Also, 1 Peter 2.9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye shall show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God's special treasures are there faithful, are for those faithful to him. This fulfills the promise he made in, in covenant to his people back in Exodus 19.5. Let's look at that. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, Keep my covenant, that you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So according to 1 Peter 2.9 we just read, Believers are God's very own possession. Have you committed your life to God for safekeeping? So continuing on in verse 18. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, and between him that serveth God, and him that serveth him not. Again, this is kind of looking forward to that day when uh, the sheep and goat judgment, uh, the judgment at the end of the tribulation, separating the wicked from the good. Remember that parable when uh, Jesus was talking about the uh, tares and the wheat, how he's going to let them grow up together, but then he's going to separate them at the end, and he's going to burn up the uh, tares. Well, those are the wicked people. So during this, uh, this throw. The one thing we can see about this uh, particular verses 16 through 18 is the fact that, uh, why am I continuing here? Uh, 
verse 18, uh, some other verses in Psalms 58, 11. So that a man might, shall say, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a judge that judges in the earth. And speaking of righteousness, let's look at Luke 1, 6. And they were brought, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Also Genesis 6, 9. Speaking of, speaking of uh, righteous people. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. How would you like to hear that said about you, that you walked with God? What an awesome, uh, what an awesome honor that is. I look forward to that day also. When they, he welcomes us into heaven, he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Okay, some other verses in Luke 2.25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Uh, he met Jesus Christ as a baby, and before he died, and his, his he was told that uh, he would witness and see the Messiah before his own death. And this is uh, Simeon, along with uh, someone else who was also worshipped at the temple uh, day in and day out, uh, trying to think of her name. Uh, it's, it's in these same passages. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I know it's here. Anna. Anna. That's what it was. Okay, so on a... So this particular, at the end of this chapter here, verses 16 through 18, we're talking about remnants. And so let's just look at it quickly again. Verse 16 through 18, and I'm going to, some other verses to tie in with it. Then they that feared the Lord spake off and one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him. For them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own soul that serveth him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Some of the verses is in Romans 9, 25 through 29. And he said also in O.C., I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which were not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall there be called the children of the living God. Elijah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Hosea actually mentions it's one-third that was saved out of uh, the entire Jewish nation. That's not a great average. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work with the Lord maketh upon the earth. And as Elijah said before, except the Lord of his Sabbath hath left us a seed, we have been as Sodom and Gomorrah, and been made like unto Gomorrah. So that, uh, because we do have righteous people, God didn't destroy the entire planet. Uh, he threatened a few times. And uh, like with the flood, but he saved eight, you know. And then, uh, of course, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was completely destroyed, except for Lot and his family. Some other verses on this, talking about the remnant, Isaiah 1, nine. Except the Lord of hosts have left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like Gomorrah. And also Romans 11.5. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, back to Ma now on to Malachi uh, chapter four. I'm actually taking the first two verses a little out of uh, a little out of a uh, sequence. So we're gonna do verse two first. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. He shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Some other verses on this in Isaiah 30 verse 26. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. 
and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wounds. Again, speaking of this day, we see in the picture when he arrives back. They say that the entire entire earth is going to be black. I can just envision that uh, all of a sudden this light will grow seven times brighter than ever before. And that will be the presence of Jesus Christ and all of us behind him arriving on earth. They say every eye will see him. Every single eye. Okay, where was I? Isaiah. That was Isaiah 30, 26. And then we got Isaiah 35, 6. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and screams in the desert. This is speaking to the Millennium Kingdom, I believe. That uh, we're going to be, uh, after this point you see in the picture, we're going to clean up the place and get it ready for the Lord's kingdom, thousand-year reign. So in the day of the Lord, God's wrath toward the wicked will burn like a furnace, as we saw in Malachi 4.1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be like stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. It's going to be a complete burning up. Also in Isaiah 5.24. Therefore, as the fire devileth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so the root shall be rottenness, and the blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of the hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. And also Malachi 3.2. I didn't put that one in there. Oh, there it is. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when they appeareth? For he is like a refinest fire, and like fuller's soap. It'll be so white. That's what the fuller's soap has to do with. The refinest fire is going to be uh, his presence. But he will be like the healing warmth of the sun to those who love and obey him. John the Baptist prophesied that these coming of Jesus, the dawn was about to break with light for those in sin's darkness. We see that in Luke 1, 76 through 79. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. This time with John the Baptist. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby that is day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them to sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of the people. Also in Isaiah, where am I? Isaiah 60, verse 20. Then, shall, then thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall the moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. And also... Revelation 21, 23, and 24. Into that final period of time which we've been talking about. And the city had no need of sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. William Kingdom. It's going to be, we won't need a light because we'll have Jesus Christ and God the Father lighten everything. And the nations of the men which were saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So we learn that no light will be needed in God's holy city because God himself will be the light. These last verses of the Old Testament are, for, are filled with hope regardless of how life looks now. God controls the future. And when everything we will be made right, we, will, we who have loved and served God look forward to a joyful celebration. Amen. This hope for the future becomes ours when our, we trust God with our lives. So look, continuing in here in this last chapter 4, in Micah 4, 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Look into Micah 7, 10, too, on this one. Then shall that is mine enemy shall see it, and shame shall cover her which 
said unto me, Where is the Lord thy God? Mine eye shall behold her. Now shall, now shall she be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Okay, going on to verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, uh, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Also looking at Deuteronomy 4 1 on this one. Now therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, but to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers hath given to you. These decrees and regulations given to Moses at Mount Sinai were the foundation of nations nation's civil, moral, and ceremonial life. Um, also, uh, Exodus 20 is included in that, but I won't read, I won't read that. You can do it on your own if you like. And, but I'll read this in Deuteronomy 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whether you go to possess it. <coughs> Remember, when we were doing well, that whole series, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Moses over and over and over again is just repeating all these different commandments and laws to the people for them to follow. And they just uh, kept re, uh, resisting God's word. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all those statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Our testimony is so important, I think. Uh, people see more, uh, can get more understanding of what God's like through seeing us in action rather than our words. So important to have a good testimony. We still must obey the moral laws because they apply to all generations. Amen to that. Hey, you got a lot of order on me. So going to verse 5 of chapter 4. Behold, I will send you, you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great, great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, this is the dreadful day of the Lord. It says, I will send you Elijah the prophet. This has a little interesting connotation because Elijah was in the Old Testament. And because of this verse, people actually all during the... Uh, time of Jesus uh, time and uh, and even even back in this time frame uh, after this uh, particular uh, book which was about 300 years before Jesus actually came on the scene three or four hundred years so during this time people had actually set an extra plate at the table uh, waiting for Elijah to come uh, they would give them a hint that uh, Jesus was coming out right after him and of course, that ended up being John the Baptist this time. But I think it's actually going to be Elijah during the tribulation, which should be one of the two witnesses that actually this verse is talking about. Because the day of the Lord almost always talks about the tribulation period, not the first coming of Jesus. But it's interesting that uh, people will ask John the Baptist if he was Elijah, and they say, and he said no. But uh, Jesus, when he was talking to the disciples, kind of made it a, an understanding that uh, th there was always a chance that if uh, people would have obeyed uh, their calling and done what they were supposed to do, that yes, John the Baptist would have been the type of Elijah. But that didn't happen because they didn't, the people rejected Jesus Christ. Some verses on this particular one. Where am I? In Matthew eleven fourteen. If you will receive it, this is of Elijah, which was for to come. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must come first? Must first come. I'm in Mark now, Mark eleven through thirteen. And he answered and told him, Elijah is very cometh first and restoreth all things and how is it written of the son of man that he must suffer many things and be set and not I'm trying to give a contrast here that particular prophecy is talking about a future date not not now 
But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and that they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of them. That's the verse I was talking about. It seems like John the Baptist is the uh, Elijah. And also in Luke 1.17. And he saw, and he shall go before him in spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's actually a quote, part of that, uh, from uh, this particular passage here, it's where it says. Uh, also, John one twenty one, and they asked him, "What then? Art thou Elijah?" And he said, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, no. That was the, the Pharisees talking to John the Baptist. So Elijah to come. Now, I think that when the, when the true Elijah comes is actually in Revelation 11, 3 through 6. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt him, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, uh, he must in, the, in this manner be killed. Verse 6. They have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over water to turn them into blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And that's what uh, Pharaoh uh, learned about the uh, about, Mo about Moses and Aaron. But when we get to the New Testament, most people believe, and I'm in that camp, that it's Elijah and uh, uh, Moses are the two prophets, the two witnesses. Okay, continuing on in uh, verse 6. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So some other verses done this, Isaiah 11, 4. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with the iniquity of the meek of the earth. He shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and, the, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And also Revelation 19, 15. This is when this happens. Let me get my other picture. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and I mean, that's talking about his words. They're very sharp. That will that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So again, that's uh, kind of a picture. You can see the armies down here preparing to try to eliminate him. Uh, very failed attempt. Uh, he wipes them out just with his words. Okay, so turning the hearts to the and fathers to the children. Again, that's in Luke 1, 17. Uh, we already read that once. I won't read it again, but uh, we did, definitely heard that. So, so in this particular passage of uh, verses 5 and 6 of chapter 4, Elijah was one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. His history is recorded, actually, in 1 Kings 17 through 2 Kings 2. With Malachi's death, the voice of God's prophet would be silent for 400 years. Then a prophet would come, like Elijah, to herald the Messiah's coming. We see that in Matthew 17, 10 through 13. I think I read this once already. Uh, I'll read it again. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So here, that's the one that actually, now they got a, the, the disciples actually helped us to see what Jesus was talking about there. Okay, so continuing on and uh, look at uh, 
verse 6 again in Malachi. I mean, Mike, yeah, Malachi 4, verse 6. Talking about turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. At least I come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi gives us a practical guideline about commitment to God. God deserves the best we have to offer. And we see that in Malachi 1, 7 through 10. Kind of go through a really quick overview of Malachi here. And we'll end it with this. So commitment to God, Malachi 1, 7 through 10. Ye offer a polluted bed upon my altar, and ye say, Wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. Remember, we, back in the beginning, we were talking about the fact that they weren't offering their best. That was, they were going through routines. They were just doing it because uh, it seemed like the thing to do. Verse 8. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? If you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? Now, you probably have more respect for, for a government leader than you would for God. Uh, now, you would... If you had like, if you were going, you know, providing something to the uh, governor of the land, most likely give you very best because you want to impress them. But with God, you weren't trying to. You should even more so want to impress God. Verse nine. And now I pray you, beseech God that He will be gracious unto us, that He hath been for your means. Will He regard your persons? Saith the Lord of hosts. When there is even among you that would shut the doors for naught, neither do ye kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. Okay, so we must be willing to change our wrong ways of living. And Malachi addresses this in Malachi 2. Look at the first couple of verses here. O oh, now, ye, O oh, ye priests, this commitment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. And so we should make our family, our family a lifelong priority. Jump into verses 13 through 16. And this have you done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering any more, receiveth with good will at your hand. Yet you say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did not he make and did not he make one? Yet have he yet Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Godly seed, I think that's speaking about Jesus Christ. We should be sensitive to God's refining process in our lives, too. Sometimes he's going to put us through trials to make us stronger and more prepared for what he has for in store for us. And that's in Malachi 3.3. 3. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So we should, and we should also remember to tithe our income. And we see that in Malachi 3, 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. They will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. And there shall not be enough room to receive it. I, I have personal experience with that as a fact that when you faithfully and uh, and, and with joy in, in, in your heart, Give unto the Lord uh, your tithes and offerings. I'm telling you, you cannot outgive God. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be rich, but he's, he's going to satisfy you in ways that are much more richer than just money. Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, 
save the Lord of hosts. See, he's going to protect little things, uh, that your crops are going to be uh, fruitful, uh, that uh, that everything, uh, that uh, things, the yields will be higher. Uh, it can even be little things like uh, you get that raise that you didn't deserve or uh, maybe you got a, a special promotion uh, because of uh, the Lord kind of whispering in your boss's ear. Things of that nature, you'll be surprised how much God is influencing your life when you're dedicated yours to him. Uh, and there, so there is no room for pride in this at all either. That's what we see in Malachi uh, chapter 3 verses uh, 13 through 15. Your words, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken so much against thee? You have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it that we should keep his ordinances, and that we should have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? That was they were doubting God's uh, commandments and trying to get around them with certain other ways. Jesus actually exposes the Pharisees to one uh, where they would allow uh, people, uh, sons and daughters, not to take care of their parents uh, by uh, basically saying that uh, they were that it was an offering to the Lord, uh, to the temple, instead of making sure that they were taking care of their their parents. So they were trying, they were, they were finding loopholes to try to get around God's commandments. So Malachi closes his message by pointing out that the that great final day of judgment for those who are committed to God, judgment day will be a day of joy. Amen to that, because it will it will usher in eternity in God's presence. Those who have ignored God will be the straw to be burned up, as we saw in Malachi 4.1. Let's look at that one more time. For behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all them that do wickedly shall be stubble. Notice proud is in there. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them with neither root nor branch. So to help the people prepare for the day of the judgment, God would send a prophet like Elijah, which was John the Baptist, who would prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah. The New Testament begins with the prophet calling the people to turn from their sins to God. Such a commitment to God demands great sacrifice on our part. But we can be sure that it will be worth it all in the end. Amen to that. So that is the book of Malachi. And I don't know what I'm going to do next week yet, uh, on Wednesday. I'll, I'll see how the Lord leads me. I got a couple of thoughts, but uh, we'll, uh, I haven't just fully decided yet, so I'm going to pray about it. So tomorrow, though, we'll be uh, back into Galatians. Uh, we're taking our pause from Acts to look at the book of Galatians. So, dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you so much for these studies and for helping me to be able to see uh, your wisdom and your knowledge through the word. And I give you praise and thanks for all the things you help me with each and every day. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Okay, so I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Have a great day.